Hello, everybody. Welcome back to AP World History. This is, well, AP World History, Unit 8 slash 9, Chapter 4, Decolonization. We're going to take a look at decolonization first in uh, East Asia, then we'll take a look at decolonization in Africa. Bell work on the screen, identified causes of the Cold War. So today we're going to take a look at decolonization. We are going to look at a end of new imperialism and kind of its replacement by a different form of colonialism. But that's something we will talk about towards the end of our presentation. Today, we're going to first focus on how decolonization will occur, some specific examples of where it will occur, and then some general trends following decolonization. So the lesson objective today is compare the processes by which various peoples pursued independence after 1900. You're going to describe Asia and Africa. So let's first take some general looks at decolonization before we look at more specific examples. And these apply to basically anywhere in Africa uh, or in East Asia during the Cold War period. So these are just general trends, as we're going to see. Well, of course, we do have kind of internal reasons why decolonization will occur, especially within these colonies. We saw that already with India. We have economic tensions between European and Western powers who control the economies of these places. We have religious and ethnic tensions that were encouraged by Europeans and other Western powers. And there is going to overall be this hostility towards the presence of foreigners, namely of imperialists, in these third world non-aligned countries during the Cold War. So we have existing colonial tensions that are mostly going to be inspired, as we'll see, by the Enlightenment, by nationalism, but also of new ideas of communism, the ideas of Maoism and Marxist-Leninism. They're going to be influential as well in shaping how these societies will look like after independence, either through the successful implementation of those communist ideas or through the uh, kind of proxy wars of the Cold War. But why specifically is decolonization going to occur after World War II? Why after 1945? Well, World War II, as we discussed last unit, is absolutely devastating to the international community, especially towards the great nations of Europe. World War II saw the absolute destruction of places like London because of the Blitz, of places like Eastern Europe, of Germany, of France. So really kind of World War II is going to devastate European, the European economy. And it's gonna kind of force Europe into sort of a position. Do we have a colony system still? Do we have imperialism? Or do we have generous social welfare programs? And in the context of the Cold War, if we're looking to prevent communism, social welfare programs are going to win out. So in order to maintain financial stability, Europe is going to say, OK, fine, just go, just leave. In a sense, we are seeing independence largely being given because of these concerns of financial stability following World War II. If we want to rebuild, we need enough money, we can't waste it on colonial administration. So World War II is going to deeply weaken the European imperial system, allowing for a expansion of decolonization. But we're also seeing kind of political and quasi moral reasons why decolonization will happen because of things like the United Nations and the Atlantic Charter. Remember the Atlantic Charter? That was that informal, uh, or I should say, that was that agreement between Great Britain and the United States. And other countries are going to sign on as well. But it's essentially going to say with regards to the colonies that we should have immediate self-independence for a self-determination for these places. And both the United States and Great Britain are going to agree to that. We are going to see the United States giving up its colonies in the Philippines. And we are seeing the British allowing for decolonization to a degree in places like 
Africa and in East Asia. But we'll look at those more specifically in a second. We also have the moral supervision of the United Nations. The United Nations is going to pioneer kind of this language and put it into words in something called the UN Declaration of Human Rights. This is inspired by the Enlightenment, but it is going to be a more universal one. It is saying that regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of whether or not you live in a Western or non-Western country, you deserve human rights. You deserve to have your own government. You deserve self-determination. So we are going to see, following World War II, following the creation of the United Nations, this language start to be enshrined by the United Nations in the UN Declaration of Human Rights that is supporting independence. So that also brings us to another moral reason why independence will be kind of granted in a way. And that's because of this kind of conflict between ideas of racial superiority and democracy. We just fought a war, World War II, against the Nazis, against people who were very much anti-democratic, but also very much in favor of racial hierarchies. And if there's anything more anti-democratic than an empire, leave it in the comments. So an empire is incompatible with ideas of democracy. It is allowing for ideas of racial supremacy. So in reaction kind of to the moral crisis of the Holocaust, we are seeing this pressure on European nations to say, give up your colonies. So these are kind of reasons why World War II is a spark of decolonization. On top of that, we are going to see kind of different ways independence will be achieved, either through the end of formal imperialism with the first two on the list right there, and the end of economic imperialism with the last option right there. We will see kind of the end of formal empires really through two ways. On the one hand, through traditional wars for independence. We will see that especially in places like Algeria. We'll see that in Kenya. We'll see a degree of violence popping up in the Congo as well. We'll see this in Vietnam. So there are wars for independence, but there are also kind of ways that nations of Africa and East Asia are kind of negotiating, I said that weird, negotiating their independence. And that is largely going to be because of internal pressures within these colonies of these mass movements, much like we saw in India of these civil disobedience campaigns, making these countries ungovernable by European colonies, by, uh, by European colonial powers, I should say. So through this kind of protest movements in these countries, we are gonna see them eventually pressure their European colonial overlords to grant them independence. Another way we're seeing independence achieved is through D. Uh, colonization economically, primarily through the process of nationalization. We are going to see nationalization occur in places that have already achieved their independence. We'll see this extensively in Latin America, but we're going to see this as well in places like Egypt. We're going to see this with the figure of Gamal Nasser. If you see Nasser, just see nationalization. He's going to nationalize the Suez Canal. He's going to nationalize oil companies. And we're going to look at uh, examples of each of these in just a second. But these are different methods of independence during the era of decolonization between 1945 and the present day. But there are also different influences of the decolonization effort. Primarily, they connect to the ideas of the Enlightenment. They connect to the idea of a Republican style government that is not ruled over by another country, by a foreign power, by a European power. So the ideas of the Enlightenment are going to inspire, especially middle class movements for independence, especially middle class movements that are advocating for independence along capitalist lines. We're also seeing the influence of nationalism, the idea that we have a national identity that shouldn't be a part of any empire. So we're gonna kind of see this in different ways. We see religious nationalism, so kind of 
the incorporation of anti-Western uh, religions, of kind of local native traditions, of Islam, in rebelling against European and Western dominance. So there is kind of this idea of nationalism being formed through religious identity. And we're also seeing the development of what we call left-wing nationalism. This is nationalism that's kind of more sympathetic to communism. We're seeing this in figures like Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. We're seeing this in figures like Sukarno in Indonesia. We're seeing this in figures like Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. So the idea of having a independent nation that has more of an equitable society, this is something that is especially popping up in the context of the Cold War. So when countries are kind of looking for this economic nationalism, this left-leaning nationalism, that's going to lead to instances of proxy wars. We're going to see this especially in the case of places like Vietnam. We've discussed Vietnam before, but we're also going to briefly discuss the Angolan Civil War. This is going to be a civil war between communist rebels and a dictatorial pro-capitalist government in Angola. So we're seeing kind of decolonization leading to tensions within these colonies over what their society should look like in terms of their economies. Some are saying we need to be more like the West. Some are saying we need to be more like the Soviet Union. Whereas others are saying we need to be our own thing entirely. And that's largely the experience of many of these decolonized countries. So what are some of the political and ideological causes for decolonization after World War II? And what are some ways colonies are achieving their independence? Let's take a look first at East Asia. And really, we're going to kind of breeze through East Asia. I'll give you a few dates. You're going to more focus on kind of uh, a few individuals in these decolonized places. So let's take a look at some new nations in East Asia. Well, we have the Philippines that's being granted independence by the United States after World War II in 1946. You have Myanmar that's negotiating its independence in 1948 following the independence of India. You also have Singapore first getting independence from the British, but then getting independence from Malaysia. And largely these countries of, Phil of the Philippines, of Myanmar, of Singapore, they are examples of negotiated decolonization. We have mass protest movements that are contributing to that notion of becoming ungovernable, and thus we are seeing the uh, negotiation of a transfer of power from the British, for example, in the case of Myanmar and Singapore, towards local government, towards freedom from the British colonial system. But the examples I want to more focus on are going to be Indonesia and Vietnam, because they're going to be countries that will win their independence through violence, through wars for independence. Indonesia, they are going to be taken over by the Japanese during World War II. They kick out the Dutch. But then when the Japanese leave, the Dutch come back. And all of these Indonesian people are saying, hey, what the heck? We just fought off the Japanese and now the Dutch are back. Let's fight against the Dutch. So there's gonna be a Indonesian revolution, a war for independence and in Indonesia against the Netherlands. And largely the leader of this is this smiling dude with the sunglasses, Sukarno. Sukarno is, he's a nationalist at heart. So he's in favor of an independent Indonesian identity. But in terms of his economics, he's kind of going to aspire to not fall in line with the Americans or the Soviets. He's going to create a form of, uh, a unique form of Indonesian national social, or I want to say national socialism, because that's something else. A unique form of uh, Islamic socialism in Indonesia. Indonesia has a very high Muslim population. And he's going to create kind of a economic program of nationalism that is very much against the foreign investment. It's against the Dutch. It's definitely against the Americans. We'll see how well that plays out for Sukarno because he's gonna be overthrown in a CIA-sponsored coup, but we'll discuss that later on. Vietnam is another example of trying to win its independence through a war against the French. We've discussed this before. 
but we're seeing the rise more of a kind of traditional uh, Cold War politics in Vietnam. We are seeing the rise of Ho Chi Minh. He at first is a left-leaning nationalist, then he's going to transition to Marxist-Leninism ideas. He is going to be more of a close ally to, um, to both China and the Soviet Union at different points in Vietnamese history. So we're seeing here kind of the establishment of a communist state after decolonization. Vietnam is the prime example of that. So these are some new countries in South and Southeast Asia. And again, very brief examination of these things. Let's take a look at Africa. And we're gonna look at Africa between really the start of the 20th century. And finally, when we have the end of apartheid in South Africa. So this is just a map. You can go over it if you like, pause the video, just kind of a different uh, years that these countries will achieve their independence in Africa. So what does Africa look like by the start of the 20th century? Well, largely we are going to see a few factors that are contributing to the independence movements of these countries in Africa. For one thing, we are seeing the use of missionary education in Africa, and that has the unintended impact of developing a local African intelligentsia. It's encouraging intellectuals in Africa to pick up literature by European nationalists. It's encouraging African intellectuals to examine independence movements in the past, in Latin America, in the United States. It's also encouraging some intellectuals to pick up the works of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin. And this is going to overall kind of lead to this feeling of nationalism in these African states. The colonial militaries, oftentimes the locals in these colonial militaries, they're gonna be trained by Western techniques. They're sometimes going towards the West to study military techniques. And in addition to these feelings of nationalism, this is kind of the basis for anti-colonial resistance especially in wars for independence in places like Vietnam, Algeria, and in Kenya. We're also seeing how the Europeans' creation of local governments staffed by members of the middle class, that's going to lead to increased autonomy and feelings of, hey, we should be independent for countries, excuse me, for local governments across Africa and East Asia. So by having local government already in the colonial system, that's going to lead to kind of the basis for a post-independence government to a degree in some places across Africa uh, and also in East Asia as well. On top of that, we're seeing how the building of infrastructure in Africa is contributing to economic development. It's contributing to agricultural development. And as such, we're going to see a rise of population in Africa. This is gonna have the unintended impact of increasing the populations of African colonial societies. That's leading to economic stress, especially over the idea of how do we equally distribute resources. So the tensions emerging from rising populations, that's contributing to an appeal towards, well, you guessed it, communism in some countries. But we're also seeing the impact of the world wars and the Great Depression. Remember, the European societies, they promised independence in exchange for cooperation. That's not really going to be achieved in the First World War, but it definitely is by the Second World War. Second World War, we see the breakdown of the European imperial system. African nations are saying, let's become independent. We're also seeing how the Great Depression is encouraging uh, feelings of antagonism against European colonial rulers because of the vast economic devastation that the Great Depression will have on these African states. In addition, during the Great Depression, we kind of do see a degree of European investment in these economies of Africa. And really, Africa is going to become a, uh, a major center of um, attempts at industrialization because of this limited amount of economic investment. And this is encouraging the rise of the middle class who have these feelings of uh, nationalism, but also feelings that, hey, 
We want to control our economy, not those Europeans. So we're going to look at a few examples of negotiated decolonization. We'll first look at Ghana, then we'll look generally at West Africa and Nigeria, then we'll look at the Congo, then we'll look at the, um, the events in South Africa. Ghana is going to be the first country to achieve its independence. It was called under the British the Gold Coast. You can guess why, because of all the gold. But Ghana is going to be the first to declare its independence. And who is leading all of this? Well, it's this gentleman right here with the raised arm, a guy by the name of Kwame Nukarme. Nukarme is going to be a left-leaning nationalist. He is in favor of kind of creating a distinct version of African socialism. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But he's going to organize Ghanans to protest the British rule in Ghana inspired by ideas of nationalism, inspired by ideas to solve economic inequalities. He's developing a political organization called the Convention People's Party, the CPP. And the CPP is largely going to be made up of not only the middle class, but also of industrial workers in Ghana's urban centers, of peasants in the countryside. So again, kind of inspired to a degree by Gandhi's mass movement programs in India. Much like Gandhi, the CPP is going to engage in boycotts. It's going to engage in nonviolent resistance. There's going to be instances of violence that will happen, especially clashes between the police, the colonial police and protesters. But we are seeing the overall movement towards a independent Ghana along kind of nonviolent lines making Ghana ungovernable, so the British are forced to leave. And indeed, the British do leave. The British are going to say, okay, enough is enough. We'll leave you alone. We'll pull out. We will focus on our own stuff. We will focus on building our own welfare system. And Ghana is kind of a prime example of how a lot of countries in the decolonizing world, they're going to try and chart their own course between capitalism, American-style capitalism, and Soviet-style communism. So Nkurme is going to uh, advocate for this idea of pan-Africanism, this idea that African nations in general, they have a unique feeling and uh, common interest in opposing both imperialism by the Soviets and the Americans. He is very much a member of the non-aligned movement. He's going to draft his own kind of vision of African socialism, which is combining local African nationalism with ideas of economic equality. So we see an example here of non-aligned movement in action in Africa. We're going to see similar kind of events of negotiated decolonization across French West Africa in places like Mali and Martinique. Uh, Mar what's that place? Uh, of places like Mali, of places like uh, Niger, across all of West Africa. This is going to break up largely on ethnic and nationalist lines into different countries. And these countries largely getting their independence through negotiation, through these mass protest movements that are forcing the British government, or the French government, I should say, to say, enough is enough, we'll let's just let you go. Nigeria is a similar example. Uh, we are going to see mass protest movement that is encouraging the British to say, okay, fine, you guys can leave. The thing about Nigeria, though, is that they are going to have a rough time following independence. We are going to see a civil war in Nigeria that is going to largely be on ethnic lines. And we are going to see in, uh, the Bafiria independence movement that's going to be backed up actually by different powers during the Cold War. So the Nigerian Civil War, an example of a proxy war, you could say, during this time, as it will involve uh, the Soviets and the Americans, and Israel will get involved, and Iran will get involved, and Germany will be involved, oftentimes on contrasting sides. It's very interesting. Um, but for the purposes of us right now, it's an example of negotiated decolonization. And yet kind of that example of Nigeria and the struggles of uh, civil wars. That's going to be something that happens in the Congo. Remember, the Congo was controlled by the Belgians, and we saw how very brutal Belgian rule was in the Congo. 
And as a result of this very brutal rule, as a result of the dividing of ethnic hierarchy, uh, of the imposition of ethnic hierarchies, we are going to see not really a unified nationalist movement in, in the Congo. We have different ethnic groups who have their own definition of nationalism. We see attempts at creating a national movement through this figure with the classes right here, a guy by the name of Patrice Lumumba. Lumumba is going to try and create a pan-Congolese movement to represent the different ethnic groups in the Congo, including groups uh, that are spread out through the Congo River Basin. This is the Congolese national movement, different ethnic groups advocating for Congolese independence. And the Belgians, they're gonna let the Congo go, basically, as a result of all these protest movements led by groups like the CNM. However, as a result of these different ethnicities in the Congo, not a real kind of cohesive national unity, we are gonna see a lot of violence emerging in Congo after independence. We are seeing left-leaning groups that are backed up by the Soviets. Uh, we are seeing uh, right-leaning groups that are backed up by the United States. You have Lumumba kind of in the middle, trying to forge his way between these different ideas. He's a bit more sympathetic to the left ideas. So this Congo crisis is this vast instance of violence in the Congo over these differing debates about what kind of society Congo will be like after independence. Will it be a communist one? Will it be a capitalist one? And unfortunately, kind of the level-headed figure of Lumumba, he's going to be assassinated. He's going to be assassinated by a joint work by the Belgian Secret Service and the CIA. Again, because he's a little too sympathetic for the communists. We see a right-wing dictatorship put in place, and the Congo is going to be kind of an example of the trend towards authoritarianism, especially as a result of American intervention in decolonization in some countries. Let's look at another place that will gain its independence first, and then it's gonna gain an independence at a different time. It's very interesting, and now let me explain what's happening. So South Africa, as we remember, has a mix between a white population and the majority an African population. It is an example of a settler domain, white domain colony during the age of imperialism. And really as a result of kind of the dominance of white people in South Africa, of white settlers, really government in South Africa dominated by white people. And these white people, they want to be like the other white people of the British empire. They wanna be like Canada. So in 1910, they are gonna petition parliament, the British parliament for self-rule and they get it. However, there are conflicts, there are conflicts within, um, excuse me, my throat is very dry. There are gonna be conflicts within South Africa, especially between the white minority and the majority of people in South Africa, black Africans. But the white minority is in charge of everything. And even within the white minority, there are racial tensions. You have the Afrikaners. These are people of Dutch and French descent that first settled in South Africa. And then you have people of British descent in South Africa. And largely we are gonna see kind of the Afrikaners win out on this. And really we have a white minority ruling over a majority black country. And this, major this minority, they are gonna hold all political office. They are going to dominate what South African politics looks like. And even by the 1940s, we are gonna see the rise of a right-wing nationalist group known as the National Afrikaner Party. And to maintain white control over South Africa, they are going to initiate a policy known as apartheid. Apartheid is a program of racial segregation. In Dutch, or rather in Afrikaans, it means separateness. It means racial segregation. It means that white people have certain areas. It means that black people have certain areas. It is say, racial segregation on a massive scale. And this is gonna have an economic impact. It's having a political impact. People of African descent, they cannot vote. People of black African descent, they cannot vote. 
they cannot form political parties, uh, at least ones that are recognized by the government. They cannot uh, be in certain economic positions. There's poor jobs available for Black Africans. And you can see that in these two images right here. These are images of racial segregation of racial preference for white people in South Africa, even though white people are minority there. And on top of that, you have the encouragement of the homeland system. And what is that? Well, essentially, it's kind of a way, reservations for different Black ethnic groups in South Africa. So different groups like the Zulu, they're going to have certain parts of South Africa that they're forced onto, free from the areas where white people are settling. It's really dividing up Africa or South Africa into these different ethnic areas and really areas of Africa uh, that are dominated by Africans largely going to experience economic hardship. So we have a lot of ethnic tensions between white and black people. We have economic tensions, which again, mostly going to fall along those racial lines. Black people have the lowest paying jobs. They are discriminated against politically and socially. And as a result, we are going to see calls for change in South Africa. But even this is a little too much for the British. The British are going to say, hey, uh, maybe you should not be so racist. So South Africa, again, dominated by the Afrikaners, is going to withdraw from the British Commonwealth. They are going to achieve a fully independent society by 1961. We have an independent republic in South Africa one that doesn't recognize Queen Elizabeth, who is in charge at the time of the United Kingdom. And really, in this atmosphere of a republic, we're going to see people saying, hey, since we're a democracy now, shouldn't we be a democracy that extends rights to everybody, including Black people? And it's in this atmosphere we see the organization of resistance efforts against the white minority in South Africa to demand racial equality. And that organization is known as the African National Congress, the ANC. It's primarily led by this gentleman right here, Nelson Mandela. Mandela is gonna be the major leader in this fight against segregation, against apartheid. And much like Gandhi, he is going to inspire a program of nonviolent resistance. The ANC is going to do a few things to provide for um, a breakdown of the apartheid government, to encourage international support for this ANC movement. So Mandela is leading this charge for the end to apartheid, to racial segregation. He's going to organize boycotts, and the other leaders of the ANC, they will organize boycotts. There's going to be mass protests across the major cities of South Africa. We are going to see especially resistance in the education field because of South Africa's government trying to impose Afrikaners as a language over the much more widely spoken British or English. So really, Nelson Mandela, he is going to be uh, advocating for a absolute breakdown of the apartheid state. He's actually going to be in, uh, imprisoned uh, during, his, uh, during the 1960s. There are going to be a wave of angry and frustrated people who are going to commit acts of terrorism. And Mandela is accused of all of this. So he's locked up in Devil's Island, uh, or, Robbers Island or Robert's Island, I believe. Um, and he is going to um, kind of be a figure that people are saying, he didn't do anything wrong, free Mandela. And that's not only in South Africa, but in governments around the world. We have people in the United States, especially the civil rights movement in the United States saying, we need to free Mandela. We cannot support South Africa. There's gonna be petitions to the United States government to say, don't support South Africa because they're insanely racist right now. Uh, so there is going to be international pressure to say, we need to end apartheid. Eventually, we are going to see under the government of de Klerk, the African uh, Afrikaner uh, leader at the time, the white president of South Africa, he's going to say, okay, I will release Mandela from prison, and we're going to have elections granted 
and we are going to have Africans be allowed to vote. And thus, we are going to see the end of apartheid after we see this election in 1990 with the ANC dominating South African politics. And to this day, the ANC, major political party in South Africa. And it's largely going to take kind of a left-leaning view. It's not exactly capitalist. So after South Africa ends apartheid, after we have true independence for the African people in South Africa, we're starting to see South Africa merge away from the first world. And yet there are going to be struggles after apartheid ends. We still see uh, racial violence, not only between white and black people, but between different ethnic groups among the African community. We're going to see kind of uh, white people fleeing South Africa because they no longer are in charge anymore uh, in South Africa. So we are going to see a so-called white flight in South Africa. South African whites, they're going to flee to places like Great Britain. They're going to go to the United States. I have an example right here of a South African going to the United States. He is a spaceship guy, Elon Musk's family. Yeah, daddy owned a little emerald mine that was operated by African workers that benefited from apartheid. So we have struggles after apartheid ends. And really, this is kind of a way that we're seeing independence, even after South Africa is technically independent. We're seeing more government for Africans rather than for white South Africans. But where are we seeing violence in the African world? Well, Algeria is gonna see a wave of violence, especially as the French are extremely resistant to let Algeria go. The French are especially resistant to let Algeria go because in 1956, they had to let Vietnam go. In the 1960s, they let all of West Africa go. So we are going to see kind of a delayed response to allow for independence of Algeria. The French are refusing to let Algeria go because there is a French white population there and they want to remain in the French Union. So there is going to be a war for independence, the Algerian war. It's extremely brutal, mass atrocities committed against Algerians committed against white settlers by the Algerians. It's very much going to be a devastating conflict, but it is going to have the impact of creating an independent Algerian state. If you're keeping track, actually, at the because uh, there will be an impact on French society, France is going to experience a political crisis, and we're going to see the creation of a fifth French Republic. So the Algerian War is an example of kind of a war for independence, largely as a result of the refusal by the French to grant independence. Kenya is another example of a, <coughs> of a war for independence. We are going to see the Mau Mau Rebellion. This is largely going to be a rebellion of Africans against the remaining white settlers in Kenya. Kenya is operated and ruled by the British. So the Mau Mau Rebellion, led by this gentleman right here, Jomo Kenyatta, he is going to advocate for a independent Kenya, one that is achieved through this rebellion. The British eventually are saying, OK, we will leave, we'll negotiate with you. And by 1964, Kenya is going to become an independent country. It's largely going to become um, more aligned with the conservative ideas of the United States, a pro-capitalist government. Kenyatta is also going to kind of negotiate with the white settlers in Kenya and say, OK, you'll have some political representation, but realize that a majority of people in Africa and in Kenya especially are black people. So you're not going to control things. It's us Kenyans that will control things. So you should be able to kind of identify different examples of negotiated decolonization, and you should be able to identify some examples of wars for independence. You should also note kind of how apartheid is ending in South Africa. So let's briefly kind of overview what's going on politically after colonialism ends. Well, let's look at kind of this idea of a Cold War economy. Well, some countries in the decolonized world, they're going to flock to the first and second world alignments. Places like pre 
1990 uh, South Africa, so apartheid South Africa, that's going to largely gear towards the United States. The South African government prior to apartheid ending, largely very anti-communist, very anti-ANC. Singapore is also going to be a pro-capitalist country even to this day. We already talked about this liberal transformation in Singapore. The Philippines is going to be backed up by the United States. There will be a Filipino dictator who is, after all, at the end of the day, not a communist. In places like Ethiopia and Vietnam, these are places that will have successful communist rebellions, communist revolutions. And they're largely going to gravitate towards the Soviet Union or, in Ethiopia's case, more towards the Chinese. But mostly these decolonized countries, they're forging their own economic systems. They are a part of that so-called non-aligned movement. They are going to create their own unique economic structures. We're going to see that with a variety of figures. We have African nationalists who are also socialists like Julius Nairi in Tanzania and with Ghana with Kwame Nkrumah. These are people that are combining ideas of African nationalism with more equitable economic policies, with ideas of socialism. So we see the creation of ideas of African socialism that aren't Soviets and definitely not American. We have figures doing the same thing in places like Indonesia with Sirkano. Uh, with Sir He's creating a kind of Islam-based form of socialism in Indonesia. That's going to run afoul of the United States, actually. The United States, they will support a coup against Sukarno, leading to the rise of a dictatorship, as we'll talk about later on, with his successful, with his successful, at, with his successor, Sarhatno. But we're also seeing decolonization in form of nationalization with figures like Gamal Nasser in Egypt. He's going to nationalize, famously, the Suez Canal in the 1950s take it over from the British and the French. So he is pioneering kind of a course between Soviet-style socialism and American-style capitalism. He's not aligned with either. He's in, in, he's in favor for economic independence for Egypt. And yet kind of a long-lasting legacy of decolonization is going to be a new form of economic exploitation, and that is going to be something we call neocolonialism. Really, the neocolonial economies that will emerge following decolonization, it's basically a continuation of economic hegemony by industrial countries like the US, like Western Europe, over countries in the developing world. We are going to see economic hegemony of industrial countries over recently freed countries in Africa and East Asia. And you can kind of see that in this political context uh, cartoon right here. This is the, the colonialism of the new imperialist age. And this right here, this is neo-colonialism. I will restructure this land in the name of economic growth. We want to create pro-capitalist governments in Africa, in Asia. And these countries, they're experimenting with industrialization. They need to depend on industrial countries for their goods to build up a consumer industrial economy. But what is causing neocolonialism? Well, generally what's causing it is instability. Politically, through wars, this is going to slow down industrialization through increased populations as a result of improvements to agriculture. That's going to lead to economic inequalities, difficulties to redistribute resources. We're also going to see the World Bank kind of giving loans to countries that can't really pay them back. So they are basically indebted to industrial nations. And eventually, this is also going to include forces like China. This is something that is kind of a debate today in African society. Is China a neo-colonial empire? because they are also sponsoring and committing kind of this idea of cultural, or excuse me, of economic hegemony. But we have other kind of struggles in the decolonizing world. For one thing, we're gonna have uh, instances of famine, especially uh, as countries are experimenting with industrialization. We're going to have 
uh, instances where there's failed collectivization programs in places like Cambodia, in places like Vietnam. We're also going to have a spread of disease during this time, especially in countries that are developing, that have political instability. We see a mass breakout of diseases of poverty, things like Ebola, things like um, uh, malaria, things like tuberculosis. But one of the most devastating in Africa, especially, is going to be the HIV AIDS epidemic. It's largely going to emerge in Africa. And owing to the kind of lack of adequate medical supplies because of a non-industrial economy, we are going to see instances of absolute devastation from, the, from this disease, not only from sexually active people, but between mother and child, for example because that's how uh, HIV AIDS can be transferred. We're also seeing this through drug use as well. So there is gonna be disease, there's gonna be famine. There's also gonna be struggles with democracy and authoritarianism, primarily kind of as a result of these proxy wars. Remember the United States, they're in favor of having a pro-capitalist dictator. If not a, uh, if you can't get a democratically elected capitalist, what's better is gonna be an authoritarian capitalist. So we're going to see that with kind of various figures in Indonesia, Sirkarno, he's going to be overthrown in a CIA coup and replaced by Sirhatno. He's going to be a pro-capitalist uh, dictator in Indonesia, leading to mass political repression. But we have other figures as well. We have Idi Aman in Uganda. We have Pol Pot in Cambodia, leading the Khmer Rouge. So we have these struggles with authoritarianism and a struggle for a transition towards democracy. We also have ethnic conflict as a result of these new governments coming to place, as a result of all these wars for independence. We have the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, a brutal communist dictatorship led by Pol Pot right here that is discriminating and establishing a very brutal system of government. In Rwanda, we have the breakdown of ethnic hierarchies when the Belgians leave. So we are seeing genocide against the Tutsi people by the Hutu. Even in the 21st century, we're seeing sectarian violence between different religious groups, between Christians and Muslims in South Sudan. That's why South Sudan becomes a country. South Sudan, largely a Christian area. Northern Sudan, or, or Sudan, largely a Muslim area. And there are attempts at economic unity, especially in trying to create free markets to generate wealth in the con continents of Africa and Asia. In Africa, we have the African Union kind of combining the resources of different African states together to, for uh, competition with the rest of the world. And also with ASEAN, with the association of Southeast Asian countries. So these are attempts at regional unity to kind of combat the influence of neocolonialism. So you should be able to identify how the economies of Asia and Africa are developing after decolonization, and how is decolonization contributing to hardship in Asia and Africa. So I'm done for today. Thank you very much. If you're getting ahead, good for you. If you're not, well, welcome. So have a great rest of the day. Goodbye. Waka waka eh.